Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, and we'll begin our reading in verse 1. And let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. And I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make, known, make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. May the Lord bless in the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. Please be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of First Samuel. Early in my ministry, it was easy to preach on parenthood. I, I wasn't a parent yet. And so you just flip open to the various passages and texts that deal with the, the responsibilities. And this is what you ought to be doing. And you shouldn't be doing this. And, and all these things that are true because they're in God's word. But uh, as you become parents, as your children grow, you are a little more anxious about the approach you take. And uh, you end up preaching to yourself. My children are, are grown. They're both out of the house. I got one of them married off last week. And uh, my role at this point, for the most part, is that of advisor, which may or may not be appreciated even now. But my prayers and my job as a role model never cease. And for those of you who are parents, you are aware of the fact, or you will be aware of the fact, that you never stop being a parent. Um, they're still your kids. They may be... I, I knew a gentleman who... Uh, uh, his mother turned on his mother's hundredth birthday. He was asked, "Is your mother, is your mother getting forgetful?" And he said, "Yes. She forgets that I'm not seven years old because he was seventy-seven. We never stopped being a parent. When my children came home from the hospital, I took this." beautiful little purple monster and I went out in the backyard and I, I held the child up to God. And I told the Lord that this child belonged to him. And as the years have passed, that vow is still in the, the back of my mind. I must ever be conscious that my children are not really mine, but they are God's. And by the way, that application goes to anything that we think we have. Our careers, our reputation, our stuff, our plans, our goals, our aspirations, all those things truly belong to God. And for most of us, about time we, we figured out that that is indeed true. Because so often we don't live that way. We live as if they are ours. And we, oh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll let God know that it's, 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 it's his, so I'll put something in the offering. But then I, I go and I live my life as if everything is mine. And our relationships are the, the hardest things to let God have. Now... One of the things we're going to be looking at in our text here is a dysfunctional home. 
Um, by the way, just to let you know, if you're unaware of this, functional homes really don't exist. Uh, we have homes that, uh, for the most part, strive to be in accord with God's word, strive to be what they ought to be, but there are always bumps in the road, unanticipated difficulties and troubles. And by the way, one of the things that, uh, that has happened in the last generation, you know, we, we, strive, we, used to, we used to say, I don't want you playing with so-and-so, and you can't watch this, and you can't do this, and I don't want you reading that, and we used to control what came into the house. And these days, that's almost impossible. You, you have the world at your fingertips. And we find it harder and harder to protect, frankly, our, our, ourselves, much less our children. And so corruption creeps in. And it adds to the, the trials, the troubles, the challenges that we face today. It says in verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim. It's right next to Puyallup. Of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. We know from another gene... By the way, genealogies are there for a reason. We know from a genealogy in 1 Chronicles that this man was a, a Levite. He's living within the borders of the tribe of, of Ephraim, but he is a Levite. He is a man of some wealth. He lived in the hill country of Ephraim. Uh, that Ramathaim Zophim is usually shortened to, uh, to Ramah, which simply means in Hebrew, the height. So he lived on a hill about 25 miles north of Jerusalem. He had a large family. Uh, when he goes to, the sacrifice, to make sacrifice every year, he uses a bull as a sacrifice. Not just a lamb, but a bull. Now, when you're doing your, your peace offerings, your Thanksgiving offerings, think of the Thanksgiving offering this way. All right? Um, six months ago, close to it, we celebrated Thanksgiving. We sacrificed a turkey. And we sat down and made that sacrifice a meal for all. The Thanksgiving offering in your Old Testament, a portion went to the priest, a portion went on the altar and was burned, but the majority of the animal was cooked. And they ate it there in the temple ground. And so this man had a large family. He was well-to-do so he could sacrifice an, an ox. But he also had a large family to feed this animal too. You know, we do the, the, the church barbecue and, and we did a, uh, we're, I don't know, I'm not going to do this. We're, we did a whole pig one year. And um, that fed a lot of people. Can you imagine doing a whole ox? My word. What a meal. That's a big steak. And uh, so a man of some means, a man of a lar with a large family, he's a true worshiper of the Lord. He's not involved in Baal worship. He is going to the, the, the tabernacle for an annual sacrifice with that feast of Thanksgiving. Now here's the problem. So far, with the, hey, this is great. This is a guy who, under the, he's doing what he can with the information he's got. He is serving the Lord. He's faithful. He's prosperous. He, everything seems to be going great for this guy. He's got a big problem, a huge problem. It says in verse 2, and he had two wives. Um, bigamy was tolerated in the Old Testament, but not endorsed. There were rules governing it. But it was not endorsed. The principle, of course, in the beginning, and our Lord cites this in Matthew chapter 19. But the idea is that uh, God made a helper that was meet or appropriate for the man. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. Any, any deviation from that is a huge headache and is a big problem. 
One of the fascinating things, by the way, as you read through your Bible, I know a lot of you read through it. As you read through your Bible, I want you to take note of the family problems that take place in Genesis, particularly with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac, not so much, but Abraham and Jacob. Look at the problems. And then as you read the law of relationship, dealing with family relationships in Exodus and Deuteronomy and so on, you will find that they tried to, that the law deals with some of the problems that took place with Abraham and Jacob, saying, Dad, you can't do that. You can't do that. It was against the, the Mosaic law, for, for example, for a man to be married to two sisters. Now, we know Jacob did that. He was sort of tricked into it. But he was married to two sisters. Two wives is bad enough. But to have them be sisters just increases the rivalry. And it is a huge, huge headache. The idea of, uh, of bigamy and, and so on also uh, undermines the illustration of Christ and his church there in Ephesians chapter 4. God made one man, one woman, to be joined together in one flesh. Anything else, including, it wasn't Adam and Steve, you've heard that before. All right, Any deviation from that is a corruption of of what God had ordained. And a man to have more than one wife. Even, you know, we have a bunch of good guys. It's easy to preach on Mother's Day. There's lots of good moms in the church, even though women are not the dominant characters in your, in your Bible. The, one of the challenges of Father's Day is there aren't any good dads anywhere in the Bible except our Heavenly Father. The best men were often disastrous dads. And so the best of all relationships is, the, the, the side of glory, is a husband-wife relationship. And I've seen some great and wonderful ones, and I have seen some disastrous ones. But I will let you know that a Christian man and a Christian woman can live in peace and harmony as husband and wife. You're empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to do and be anything you're supposed to do and be. And if you two got hooked up together, you can do it. There may be challenges. There may be personality difference. There may be all different kinds of baggage and so on that come into this relationship. But I'm telling you, by the grace of God, it can work. And don't tell me I fell out of love. Well, you didn't fall into love in the first place. You made a decision whether you realize it or not. I need to make a decision to stick it out. Every time there is more than one wife in your, your Bible, there is always trouble. Always. Count on it. Uh, there is trouble and discord. Now, why is that? Why, first of all, why, did the, why would a guy marry two? I love and adore my wife. You couldn't give me, I wouldn't take a billion dollars for her. But I wouldn't give you a nickel for another one just like her. One is all I want, one is all I need, and frankly, she said she'd killed off all the rest of them. <laughs> and so what was the justification? Why would a guy marry more than one? Well, kings did it for prestige. But a man like Alcana, as we will see, very, here's probably the scenario. <clears throat> he married the love of his life. And her name is Hannah. She's going to be the character we're looking at in just a little bit. And he loves Hannah dearly. But Hannah has a problem. Hannah can't have children. The genealogies also in your Old Testament, and frankly your New Testament, are there also because there's an emphasis on producing an heir. It is a very important thing. In the Jewish economy and so on, it was very important to produce an heir. And if the wife, it was justification in the, in the rabbinic uh, writings that you could divorce your wife if she couldn't, if she couldn't have children. In the Old Testament, 
they would often get around that by, well, I married the love of my life. I love and adore my wife. She can't have children, so I'll marry another one. I'll keep the first one because I love her. I'll marry the second one so I can have an heir. And that's evidently what Elkina did. Now, you, like I said, you, this creates big strife because you have the same problem, the same exact scenario with Jacob, with Leah, and Rachel. He adores Rachel. He loves Rachel. Rachel is the, the love of his life. Leah is the one that keeps popping the kids out. And Rachel is jealous. Give me a child! Well, then I'm not in God's shoes to give you a child. And Leah has... I don't know, why did she have six? She had six kids. And her sister's pulling her hair out, and there's this increased rivalry. And you have this here. You have Hannah, and then you have Penina. Penina is not only overly fertile, but boasts about it and makes Hannah's life miserable. Because when you have this rivalry, each of the wives wants what the other one has. The one wants the love of the husband, and the other one wants to have the children. And so you have this, this ongoing rivalry that will never go away. Not entirely. Now, Hannah is almost certainly the, the beloved first wife. In verse 8, it says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? The guy's not necessarily real perceptive either. And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? He, he did spoil her. He cared for her. But she wasn't the, the only woman in his life. It says in verse 6, and her adversary, they use that word. That's the other wife, is the adversary. Her adversary also provoked her sore to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, they probably maintained separate households. He probably had two different homes. Because the rivalry here seems to be set at the, at the annual sacrifice. The family lived apart, maybe the same community, but they lived apart. But they got together when they went down to Shiloh for the, for the, uh, for the sacrifice. And so the family is sitting there, and the two wives sitting at the same table, and Penina, the adversary, is certainly going to take advantage of the circumstances. Boasting of all their children, by the way, I'm pregnant again. How about you, Hannah? She provoked her sorely. Hannah longed to have children. Hannah was probably 10 or 12 years older than Penina. They had been married for quite some time before he probably took on another wife so they could have children. It was Hannah's heart's desire. It was considered a reproach. You read this in the Old Testament. If she was unable to have children. By the way, Scripture is filled. We have, I, I, we have the, the, the mother of, of Samson. We have Rebecca, we have Sarah, we have Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. We have these women that were, and also the Shunammite, who were evidently unable to have children, and yet God, years down the road, blessed them with children. Sarah was 91 years old. But Hannah longed to have children and had none. And Penina had a whole herd of them and provoked Hannah and, and, and antagonized her and so forth. And so there at Shiloh, there at a time of feasting, there at a time of festivity, with this bickering going on, this harassment, this belittling going on, it says in verse 10, and she, referring to Hannah, was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She's gotten up from the table. She's over near the tabernacle tent itself. 
And she vowed a vow. She made a promise to God. And said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, give me a son, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. What kind of vow is this? What kind of promise is this? She asked for a son. And the son would be given to the Lord. And then it says no razor will come upon the head. Okay, two things we need to look at. Number one, at this time, almost certainly, if you go back and look at the chronology and so on. We preached on Judges here, what, a year or so ago. Um, Samson may have been alive at this time. There's a strong likelihood of it. And so perhaps the, the hero of Israel with his long braided locks was a known quantity. But what is this idea? Is it, am I going to make him into another Samson? What's the goal there? No, we have the, the Nazarite vow that's recorded there in Numbers chapter 6. It was the idea of one holy and completely consecrated to God. Now very often it was for a, time, it was for a window of time. I'm going to have a Nazarite vow during, for this year, and single out a year or, or six months or whatever it might be. The preparation was you shaved your eyebrows, your hair, your beard, everything. Everything comes up. Okay, Adriana, got to shave off that beard. All right? And you, you start afresh. Just follow your dad's example. You just shave it all off. And he went through a sacrificial process. There was a, the cleansing process and so on. And then you let it grow out. And a Nazarite, from the time that his vow was started, did not cut his hair. And it was there for all to see, all, because it was, it was conspicuous. Jewish men did not like... We see these pictures of Jesus with hair on his shoulders. It didn't happen that way. The Jewish men kept their hair cut. Not necessarily, you know, tapered in the back and so on, but they kept it shut. Kept it cut short. Shorter. And, and so it would be a notable thing. And so she's saying, I'm going to commit this child to you. He will be wholly given to God. From the womb, his hair will never be cut. Also, they were not allowed to, to eat anything derived from the vine. They couldn't eat, even eat grape seeds, much less wine or raisins or grapes or anything of that nature. And they couldn't touch anything unclean. By the way, knowing the rules for the Nazarite helps you to see, as you go through the life of Samson, he, he kept breaking his vow over and over and over again. You weren't allowed to, to, to desecrate your, your standing of, of cleanliness. Ceremonial cleanliness. And yet he's, he's killing people. He's handling uh, the, the jawbone of an ass, part of the dead body of an unclean animal. He goes and scoops the honey out of the dead body of a lion. He wants to get married to a pagan Philistine. He keeps breaking his vow. But Hannah says, this child will be devoted to the Lord from the womb. She makes the vow. Now, Eli, who is the high priest at the time, Eli, is whose two sons, the Bible says, were sons of Belial. They were sons of the devil. They were wicked, wicked men. Serving as priests there at the tabernacle. But Eli is watching Hannah. Hannah is... All teary-eyed. Her voice is hoarse. She's praying. And it says in verse, uh, in verse 12, And it came to pass that she continued praying before the Lord. By the way, just as a side thing, in liturgical churches where they have the prayer book and so forth, well, I went, I've been to a few funerals for that. Good grief. In order to be a, a minister in one of those churches, all you've got to be able to do is read. You don't have to be able to do anything else. Just crack up. No, no, which, pull out the bookmark and read. That's all you have to be able to do. Prayer is spontaneous. I am, how would it be if, if every time you, you, 
Men, every time you converse with your wife, you, you just turn to the right page. Oh, let's see. Today is, uh, is, uh, is May the, uh, let me see, look on the bulletin. May the 8th. So I turn to the page of May the 8th, and this is what I'm going to say to my wife today. That would get old. I've been married for a while. She'll be able to figure out what you're She just had to look at the same book. Oh, this is what he's going to say to me today. I better not look ahead. I want to have at least some measure of surprise and so on. Uh, we are to pray to God. We are addressing God. We are talking to a person. We are not making a recitation. We are praying to God. We are talking to God. And we see this with Hannah. We are dealing with, with a, 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 uh, a conversation that she's having with God. This is not something that she has rehearsed. She is pouring out the, the burden that's on her heart. And so it says, it came to pass as she prayed before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. She's watching her, he's watching her lips move. And he draws a conclusion, an erroneous conclusion, but he draws a conclusion. Now Hannah spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk. She's hunkered down, she's by herself, maybe shaking from the, the, the weeping that she had been doing. Her lips are moving, he thought she was drunk. How long wilt thou be drunk and put away thy wine from thee? And Hannah answered graciously and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunken neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid, a daughter of Belial, just like your sons are. She doesn't say that. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. I, I'm pouring my heart out to God. Which, by the way, is a good practice. We, we fret. We get all torn up inside. We go through some, some tragic, tragic experience. We're going through heartache and trouble. And we get anxious and depressed when the reality is that we ought to be pouring our hearts out to God. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel, he doesn't know what, what this prayer is about. The God of Israel, grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Prayer gives us comfort. I can trust the outcome to God. Now, he may not give me the very thing I want, but I can trust in God for the, the right outcome. So much better to trust him than what I want. Because God knows the end from the beginning. There's some things that I pray for. Oh, be, I'm glad God didn't give me that. There's a lot of times hindsight, oh, am I glad God, God didn't give me that. I am so glad God intervened and, and kept this from happening. This is the thing I wanted. This is the thing I'd been praying for. And God intervened and blew it out of the water. It was gone. And yes, I may have been upset, and yes, I may have been angry, and yes, I may have been frustrated, but, you know, a few, few, few days, months, years go by, it's like, boy, God was gracious and merciful to me. <laughs> Hannah finds comfort and confidence. And God gives her an answer. Look at verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord. This is while they're at Shiloh. They spent a couple of days there. And returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time came about that Hannah had conceived and she bare a son. She called his name Samuel. Say, because I have asked him of the Lord. God gave her the desire of her heart, and she named him Samuel. Samuel means heard of God. Named in testimony of the, the answered prayer. I have a, a friend who lives in the state of Illinois. 
he and his wife married while they were in their, in their 30s. And two years go by, three years go by, four years go by, no children. Clock's ticking. They began to pray. And God gave them a son. And you can guess what his first name is. God answered the prayer because God could trust Hannah. James chapter 4 and verse 3 says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Sometimes, God does not give us the answers to our prayers because he can't trust us with them. If God gave us the thing that we were asking for, we would misuse that very thing that we had been pleading for. But God could trust Hannah. She would keep her vow. She would fulfill her trust. I've only done this once at Grace. It's when we were in the, when the, in the first building. We had a baby dedication service. It's what Baptists do instead of christenings. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to find a text for this. But very often, parents will devote their children. I did that privately with my children. We are to teach our children. We are to be good examples to our children. And we ought to have our children go to church. I know sometimes they reach out, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I want to go do this. I want to do this. Um, we hear so often, don't force religion on your children. How many of you heard that? Yeah, all right. We force all kinds of things on our kids that are far less value than biblical instruction. I mean, good grief, we send them to our public schools so often. They can go to the doctor. I used to cry all the way to the doctor and get my shot, and then I'd be happy on the way home. My brother would be oblivious, going, no, 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 go to the doctor, and he would cry in the room. My mom used to have to hold him so he'd get his shot, and he'd cry all the way home. Oh, we hated going to the doctor because that we just we were, I didn't want to be a pin cushion, you know. And this was the guy who wouldn't hide it behind his back. He'd sit there, and, all right, give me your arm. And then, then we get dragged to the store. The thing I hated the most as a child was get dragged into a women's clothing store, and there were no there was no place to sit down. So I'm, and I'm sorry, very few women, I'm, I, I'm apologizing in advance, very few women can go into a, a women's clothing store and just walk in and say, there it is, and go to the register. We don't, we don't, they don't do that. And, uh, and so it's like, you know, how, how many of you guys, when you were when you were young, used to hide inside the circular clothes? Any play hide and seek? Okay, yeah, look at this. All right, all right. Yeah, you got it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So we drag our kids to the store. And yet, I don't want to force religion on my children. And yet, we do all this other stuff. All that is is an excuse for you to say, I am unwilling to go to church myself. They ought to be in a church that is true to the word of God. And so Hannah was entrusted with an answer to her prayers. Verse 24. And when she had weaned him, when she had finished nursing him, in that, by the way, a lot of cultures around the world, it's still the case. That he probably would have been up close to three years old. When 
When she had weaned him, she took him with her. She had not gone back to Shiloh during that whole time. When she'd weaned him, she took three bullocks. They would take one before, and that was, that was a big sacrifice. She takes three bulls with her. She takes an ephah of flour, which is three times the normal amount for a sacrifice. She takes all these things in gratitude and thanksgiving. And she brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. He's just a little guy. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli, the high priest. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked him. And therefore I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. He shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And when she went home, Samuel stayed at the tabernacle. And Eli became his foster father and did a much better job with Samuel than he did with his own. He is devoted to the Lord. She had promised this in her prayer. She had vowed a vow to God. Had committed this little boy to a Nazarite vow. And as far as Hannah was concerned, Samuel belonged to God. Does this mean she, she didn't love? I've, I've, I've had my child, I'm good to go. No, I'll guarantee you there was, there was a lot of weeping at the party. She loved that son. It was a huge personal sacrifice. Very likely she saw him once a year. Parenthood, as is everything else that we have, is a stewardship. In reality, our children, and frankly anything else that we have, that includes our goals, desires, and so forth, they belong to God. The lending, now look at, you got to look at it this way, flip it over, the lending is God loaning something to us? And in parenthood and a number of other things, as much as possible, it is our responsibility to send them out fit for the master's use. Now, I mentioned dealing with this. This is, this is, this is simply the latest excuse. You can't control everything. And even if you could, the problem is one of the heart. Proverbs 22.6, the motto of virtually every Christian school, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What is a proverb? Well, a proverb is a, is a basic truth. That this is usually the case. Are there exceptions to Proverbs? Yes. But this is the, they're, they're maxims. This is what, how it usually is. Proverbs 22.6 is a proverb and not a promise. You cannot, it isn't like a recipe. I follow the recipe very carefully. I've laid out all my ingredients in advance. I have my measuring spoons and measuring cups all lined up. I will not make any mistakes. All my stuff, my spices and so on are dated just the right way. Nothing is expired. I've got everything. I've even left this out to gain to room temperature. Okay, I've got it all laid out here. And if I put all my stuff in the bowl, mixing and letting it sit and doing all the things exactly as it's supposed to go, I follow the recipe. Then theoretically, 
Everything will turn out at the end. Parenthood is not a recipe. There are always the, the unexpected. Things that we don't have control over. <laughs> I've been with a situation where a guy ordered something. Very expensive thing. It's a car park. It's a drivetrain. And he took it out of the box. He put it in the car. And it wouldn't work right. Oil was going all over the place. What was the problem? They put the wrong part in the box. It was a marine drive. It spun the other way. You can't control all these things. But I can pray. By the grace of God, I can live the example. I can do everything that I'm supposed to be doing. And we need to pray as Hannah prayed. It's up to God. And can God trust us with the answer? And I'm not talking about just with our children. I'm talking about anything else. The book of James in that passage I, I cited earlier is dealing with prayers in general. Can God trust us? We sometimes wonder, well, you know, so-and-so, he gets these opportunities, and so-and-so gets to do this, and so-and-so gets to do this. Why does God let so-and-so do it, but he doesn't let me do it? Well, it's because God can trust so-and-so with it, but he probably can't trust you, and you don't even know it. Are you devoted to the Lord? Are your children, as far as you're concerned, devoted to the Lord? I prayed for my children before they were born, before, before we had any children. Prayed for my children. And grandchildren. Are your goals, your aspirations, your plans, your property, your time devoted to the Lord? If not, don't expect your children to be devoted either. I cannot make my children become Christians. I can't make my children believe. I can't make them serve. I learned a long time. I can't make anybody else do anything. I can make their refusal painful and unpleasant. You, parents of small, you can't make a toddler do what they're supposed to do. You can't do it. I have seen children that, not my own, although I probably could say the same thing about some of my own at times. I know a guy, when he was less than three years old, locked his mother out of the house. Dad was working over a half an hour away. And the mother kept threatening this child, and he was laughing and pointing at her. Oh, he was having a great time. Went around, locked all the doors, locked all the windows. Dad came home from work. The, ch the child was amply punished and thought it was worth it. You can't make people do what's right. But as much as possible, we need to teach them. We need to live the role before them. I've cited this before, that what is the, the primary reason that children forsake the faith of their parents? Three reasons, primarily. Everything else is very minor. Three things. Number one, they're not really born again. That's number one. They're not really born again. Number two... No one is answering their questions. They, they, in their study, in their, their class, in the preaching and so on, Bible questions come up. How come this is so-and-so? They have, they have some questions, and no one wants to answer their questions. Well, if they're unwilling to answer my questions, then it must be, they're, they're, there's a serious problem here. It can't be answered. And so they lose their, their confidence in the Word of God. And then the third one is they've not seen a consistent role model. best role models at home. 
Those three things are the chief stumbling blocks for our children. Is my child devoted to the Lord? Will I let my child serve God if he cho chooses to? I have known of parents that didn't want their children, fought tooth and nail to keep their kids from going into the ministry or from going to the mission field. I don't want my kid going overseas. I won't see them. I won't see my grandchildren. They got to stay here. I read the story years ago about a man whose daughter was going to China back in the 1920s as a missionary. Back in the day where you didn't come home every four years, you may never come home at all. Back before inoculations and so on, you couldn't be, you could get whatever diseases they had, and half the missionaries died on the field from diseases their first term, first few years. And the man was putting his daughter on the train. And a bystander says, what, what, what are you doing here? Well, I'm sending my daughter to China as a mission. Don't you know that you will probably never see your daughter again? She's going to a dangerous place. The man said, God gave his son. I can give my daughter. People make all sorts of terrible decisions. Some folks do it on a regular basis. I hear, as a pastor, people who make messes of their lives, people who shoot themselves in the foot, reload, and then shoot the other foot. That happens more often than you know. How much better, and by the way, this is true for all of us, how much better to let God have the life. How much better to let God have my life? How much better to let God have the lives of my children? A child is far better off in all respects in the hands of God than pursuing a course that I might dictate or desire for them. For this child, I prayed. And that never ends. May we follow suit. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the testimony of a woman who lived 3,000 years ago. And yet, Father, it is recorded for our benefit. Father, may God be able to trust us May we be trustworthy with the, with the task that you have called us to do, with the lives that you have committed to our care. And Father, that includes our own lives. Father, we make messes of our own lives. May we not share that with, with others about us. Father, may we pray. And Father, may we recognize that the lives around us, including our own, are not really our own. And Father, may we commit them to you. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen.